And in March of 1943. Where were you living at the time? Where was I? Mm -hmm. in, here in Waterbury. Waterbury. I was employed at that time at the Citizens and Manufacturers National Bank as an inter-office communicator, better known as a messenger boy. <laughs> Why did you pick the service branch that you I had no choice since I was drafted. Uh, a number of the people from Waterbury at that time went into the Navy. Uh, I went into the Army. Do you recall your first days in the service? Very much so. Would you like to describe them? Well, uh, my uh, initial time was uh, at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. That's where all draftees from this area were sent to uh, for uh, determining where they would ultimately end up in the military. Uh, I was sent from Fort uh, Devons to Camp McCoy, I'm sorry, to, to Fort Sheridan. Um, Fort Sheridan was located about 30 miles north of Chicago on the uh, banks of, the, uh, of Lake Michigan. And uh, there I received my basic training for the better part of 90 days. And uh, during that period, uh, the basic training was done with an anti-aircraft unit. It was the 777th Anti-Tank Battalion, but we were doing primarily anti-aircraft work. Um, one of the things that I, I vividly remember was shortly after going to Fort Sheridan, on Mother's Day, I was on KP duty, and it was my uh, wish to go to Mass that morning. And I went to the orderly room, which is the office, and I asked the sergeant on duty if I could attend Mass. And he said, uh, Private, you're in the Army, you're on KP duty, you're going to stay on KP duty for the rest of the day. Um, during the next week, I had the opportunity to go see the chaplain and I told the chaplain exactly what happened. And within a matter of days, an order came down uh, from the headquarters of the unit saying that any uh, service personnel who wished to attend a religious service of his choice would be allowed to do so. Uh, so to that degree, I felt I had some sort of an impact on what would happen uh, for future draftees who wanted to go to a religious service and were denied the opportunity to do so. Um, after the experience at uh, Fort Sheridan, uh, while there I was uh, selected to go into the Army Specialized Training Program and that's when uh, I ended up at the University of Michigan. And the purpose of that program was to take an engineering course because the Army felt that there was a need for engineers uh, as the war moved on. Uh, during the next uh, six, seven months, I was able to complete an accelerated three semesters of basic engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, at the conclusion of that period, the Army decided that they wanted to shut down the Army Specialized Training Program because there was a growing need for military personnel to be shipped overseas as replacements for service, service members who had been killed or injured and the divisions needed to come back to full strength. So as a result, the Army Specialized Training Program was shut down and I was sent to uh, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, where I joined the 76th Infantry Division. Uh, the 76th Division had just had all of their privates and PFCs transferred out of the unit 
to go overseas as replacement troops. Consequently, the only people left were corporals and sergeants, and it meant that those of us who were shipped into the 76th Division, especially as privates as I was, were given assignments that ranged from guard duty to KP duty to battalion detail on a rotating basis, which we did uh, consecutively for a period of several weeks until more personnel came into the division and we could start our basic training. Now our basic training was scheduled to be, again, a 90-day period. During that time, I had the opportunity to go to a radio school at Camp McCoy, and that lasted for uh, two to three weeks, where basically we were studying Morse code. Uh, that would give us the opportunity to be of uh, assistance to the Signal Corps if uh, there was a need for people with that skill. Um, and while there, I um, applied for officers' candidate school and uh, was finally accepted uh, so that uh, within a short period of time, I transferred out of the 76th Infantry Division to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, where I attended the Officers' Candidate School for a period of three months. I graduated from OCS in December of 1944, received my second lieutenant's commission, and came home on furlough for a uh, seven to ten day period. That gave me an opportunity to at least uh, enjoy some time at home before I returned to my unit, which was then in, in uh, New Jersey, where we uh, got aboard the, uh, the Queen Mary and used that as a troop ship to go across to, uh, to Scotland on the Firth of Clyde and we disembarked there, got on the troop train, which brought, brought us down to Liverpool, England. At that point, we got on a uh, troop carrier, which crossed the English Channel into uh, France. And from there, it took us a day and a half on boxcars to get up to Holland. And that's where I joined the 84th Infantry Division. How did you decide to go to officer candidate school? Um, I felt that since I was in the service that I had a choice of either being sent wherever the Army felt they wanted to send me or try to prepare myself to get as high a rank as I possibly could. And the avenue to do that was to go to officer candidate school. And that's why uh, I applied for OCS. Do you remember your instructors from basic training? Um, basic training was uh, less than thrilling because their job was to try to turn out soldiers who would act in a professional manner, uh, particularly in OCS, where the drill instructors uh, operated within our unit on a daily basis and graded the performance of all of the applicants to OCS. There were probably 60 candidates for officer training uh, when I started at Fort Benning, Georgia, and roughly 40% of us survived. The other 60% washed out for a variety of reasons. Um, one of my first assignments was at a night exercise where we were dropped off at a road marker at uh, probably 10 o'clock at night, and we were given a map, 
in a period of three to four hours to reach another destination uh, probably five miles away. And we were equipped with a compass and a flashlight. And the assignment was to bring a, a, a squad of uh, candidates, which numbered 10 to 12 people, from that location to a destination point. That meant that we had to use our compass to follow the azimuth, which is the direction that the compass would allow us to go as far as sight would allow us to travel. And over hill, over dale, uh, it became a, uh, an interesting map reading path to follow the location. And we got within probably a mile of our destination when we came upon a barbed wire entanglement. And that, of course, was deliberately set up to impede our travels. And since I was the leader of the patrol at that point, um, I had to make a decision as to how I would get this group through the barbed wire entanglement. I took my rifle, put it on the barbed wire, and laid on top of my rifle. And that depressed the barbed wire sufficiently so that all the members of my unit were able to stand on my back and walk across the barbed wire without being impeded in any fashion. I was counting them as they went across me because I knew how many there were. And uh, just before the last individual went across, I felt a tap on my shoulder. And it was the officer who was the uh, man who was in charge of our unit and who was grading our performance. And he said, what's your name, Private? And I said, Blair. He said, thank you. He walked across me and we completed our destination. We ended up on a road at exactly the spot that we were supposed to reach, which was uh, fortunate. But uh, that was one of the most memorable events I had at OCS because it gave me an opportunity not only to lead a patrol to a destination, but to use an innovative technique to get across a barbed wire entanglement. And I'm sure that that uh, worked in my favor when his report of the exercise was turned in. This was a specific task for officer candidates? Um, yes. While you're at OCS, you're divided up into, uh, into a squads, 10 to 12 people to a squad. And on a rotating basis, a squad would be given a different assignment each day. Uh, for example, one of my good friends uh, had an assignment to take his squad, and I was a member of the squad, uh, from point A on the map to point B on the map. And I had a copy of the map, he had a copy of the map. Um, it required that you be able to read the map and understand the terrain features based on the topography uh, shown on the map. Uh, we were supposed to go from point A to point B. Well, we kind of missed point B and went to point C, which meant we bypassed the destination. Um, Two days later, he was on his way back to Louisiana, having washed out of OCS by not being able to read the map properly. That's the kind of techniques that wash people out. Uh, others were just uh, lacking in leadership skills uh, or, for whatever reason, didn't want to pursue being an officer, and they went back into the ranks as, in, as enlisted personnel. So it was a it was a challenging exercise, and a very memorable one. What were some things that helped you get through these experiences? Well, um, we had to do a fair amount of reading because we had service manuals. Uh, we had to be knowledgeable on on everything from map reading to uh, tactics 
to strategy, uh, to leadership uh, modules, etc. And you try to package all of these together, um, do your job, and keep your nose clean, and uh, so be it. Uh, that wasn't always uh, an easy thing to do. Um, three quarters of the way through my experience there, I remember one evening there was a Bob Hope uh, show at the local theater, and a whole group of us went to the show. And that meant we weren't going to be able to get back to the barracks in time for bed check. And as fate would have it, uh, when bed check came, Blair was among the missing. Um, but there were so many others who were missing that same night that nothing ever happened. And uh, that was a cause of real concern because that alone could have uh, been a reason to wash the candidate out mm -hmm. because he missed bed check. He wasn't there. Fortunately, th there's safety in numbers sometimes, and I think that's what happened in this case. They would have washed out half of the, uh, of the group because they were all in the movies. Right. Right. Did you find there was a lot of that sense of camaraderie? between? The oh, very much so, because uh, the support system was necessary in order to help everyone do their job appropriately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything that you learned reading about tactics? Um, Everything that I learned about tactics came into play later on in my service uh, when I was overseas. Uh, for example, um, when I joined the 84th Infantry Division, I was assigned to Company H of the 333rd Infantry Regiment, and this was a heavy weapons uh, platoon. We were the heavy weapons platoon, and there were three separate rifle companies in the same unit, in the same battalion. Um, our, our initial assignment brought us into position on the Roar River, and that's R-O-E-R, because there's also an R-U-H-R river in, in Germany. And on this Ruhr River, we were about a mile or so from the Germans who were on the other side of the Ruhr River. And through binoculars, we could see them, we could hear their vehicles on the other side of the river. And uh, I remember we were out in a courtyard. There were probably a half a dozen of us playing catch with a ball. And all of a sudden, a shell came in and landed just outside of the courtyard. Well, based on my training, I remembered the first thing you do is hit the deck. So I immediately took a prone position. I looked up and I looked around. There were no, no other servicemen in the courtyard. They all went into the house, around the courtyard, into the cellar. Mm -hmm. They were all experienced combat people. I came in as a replacement officer into a unit that had already had their platoon leader killed. I took his position. I was new on the job, but I remembered my military training. Hit the deck if a shell comes in. They knew that by experience, if a shell comes in, you get under cover first. You don't just lay down where you are. So I learned in a hurry that if a shell is coming in to your approximate position, get out of harm's way as fast as you can, because there was a lot more protection in the cellar than there was out in the open where I was. Did I learn something from tactics? Yes. Was it always the right way? Not necessarily. I learned by experience. Okay, we're going to go into your experiences in the wars. 
What war did you serve in? This was World War II. Where exactly did you go once you left the United States? After I left the, uh, the, the States, um, is what you're referring to? I, I ended up with the 84th Infantry Division in Herlene. I said Holland. I think Herlene is probably in Belgium. Uh, it's very close. Herlene was the name of the uh, place. And that's where uh, uh, I first joined the 84th Division, was assigned to Company H. Um, once we started to advance towards the front, uh, we no sooner got into position when we were sent down into the Battle of the Bulge. Um, this was in the, in the winter, of course, of, uh, of 45, and uh, that had to be one of the coldest winters on record in the Bulge area. Um, we were fortunate to be in a backup position uh, to the uh, members of the 3rd Army, which was General Patton's army. And we were not in the Bastogne area, but we were in the Battle of the Bulge area where we could provide uh, meaningful support to the frontline troops. And fortunately, we were only there for a period of not more than a week. When we were ordered to return to our original location, which was with the, um, the Ninth Army. Before we left the Bulge area, uh, the decision was made by, uh, by uh, uh, our division headquarters. We had to remove all of the insignia from our arms in other words, we had the 84th Infantry Division patch. We had to take that off. All of our vehicles had to be painted over as far as the division's uh, unit location and insignia was concerned. And the thought was that we would return to our positions on the Ruhr River under the cover of darkness without the Germans knowing that we had come back from the Battle of the Bulge area into the Ruhr River. We got into our positions, and the next morning, a German airplane came over. It was like a Piper Cub, and they dropped leaflets. I was able to get a hold of one of the leaflets, and on the cover of it was a picture of the rail splitter, Division Insignia, the 84th Infantry Division Insignia, and it said, Welcome back, rail splitters so much for intelligence. They knew exactly who was going where, and uh, they proved it by dropping these leaflets to let us know that we weren't fighting a bunch of dumbbells, and that regardless of our trying to move up under the cover of darkness and, uh, and under a stealth approach, that the Germans were well aware of who they were up against. And we were consequently aware that we, we were against a, a pretty intelligent and formidable foe. Um, we ended up crossing the Ruhr River um, in, uh, in February um, in order to start advancing with our entire sector as we pushed across towards the Rhine River, and um, we ultimately got as far as the city of Dalkin, and that's where I received uh, my first contact with uh, German artillery shells, and uh, I received a, uh, a wound on, on my leg from the artillery shell in the late morning. Uh, and that was in March of uh, 45. Um, later that afternoon, we were advancing through the city of Duncan. And at this point, 
we came under attack by a mortar barrage, an artillery barrage from the Germans, and our uh, unit was walking down the middle of a cobblestone street, and we, as soon as we heard the shells coming in, we, we dispersed uh, on either side of the road into houses along the, the street. And as I stepped on the porch of a house, a shell hit the roof directly over my head. And uh, I've always felt that I was fortunate because the bulk of the shrapnel dispersed outwards from the shell itself. Uh, and a minor portion of the shrapnel penetrated uh, not only the roof, but uh, my leg as well. And uh, I was blown into a staircase as a result of a concussion. Uh, it was at that point that I was evacuated from my unit, uh, went back to our headquarters unit, and went back further to a, uh, a field hospital that had been set up in a farmhouse and there the doctors removed the shrapnel. Uh, we got in an ambulance, and the next morning we uh, drove into a uh, general hospital at Aachen, Germany. Um, the general hospital couldn't take any more evacuees because they were full. Uh, we were put on a troop train and went to uh, Paris, where we ended up in a uh, general hospital. And uh, it was a little eerie because when we were removed from the troop train, uh, we were on stretchers, and there was a German on each end of the stretcher carrying us because they were prisoners of the Americans working at the uh, hospital as part of their prisoner duties. Uh, so I was able to at least get back to a hospital in, uh, in Paris. And uh, I was uh, ambulatory, even though the leg was uh, heavily bandaged. I could still walk around and uh, help serve other uh, wounded personnel who couldn't get out of bed. I could help serve them at mealtime and, and things like that. And uh, after a few days, the uh, number of injured personnel was so heavy coming back from the front that we were evacuated further to a field hospital in Le Mans, France. And I spent the next uh, several weeks recuperating there where the wound had pretty much healed. And then I started my return visit to try to get back to my original uh, assignment with the 84th Infantry Division. But that took uh, the better part of a week to work my way up through the various replacement depots uh, to get back to my unit, who by that time had uh, gone through a, a good part of Germany itself and were sitting on the west bank of the Elbe River. Can you describe the circumstan circumstances surrounding the first time you got wounded in that day? Um, the, the fact that um, I had a machine gun platoon meant that our job was to support the riflemen. And as we were advancing through the city of Duncan, the riflemen were making uh, excellent progress because there was a tank unit that was assigned to our division. And the doughboys, the infantrymen, were riding on the tanks going through the town. This meant that they were bypassing some of the snipers 
who were in the buildings on either side of the of the uh, road going through the town. We being a heavy weapons platoon meant that the men were carrying 80 uh, uh, mortars or machine guns. Um, a 30 caliber machine gun is a pretty heavy piece of equipment. The barrel alone, uh, the outside casing is probably uh, five inches around with the barrel in the middle. It's water cooled and they're heavy. So we, the, uh, the heavy weapons platoon, couldn't just jump up on a, on a tank and ride. We had to walk. So we had to kind of play catch up. The riflemen were already going through town and we were walking through town. And uh, it became kind of hazardous because as we were going, there were snipers in some of the buildings who were taking pot shots at our, our troops as we went through town. And uh, that was a scary situation. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else get wounded that day? Um, I was fortunate to be the, the first one in my platoon to get hit. Um, I say I was fortunate because the very next day I was out of the picture back in the hospital and my platoon, while it was advancing, uh, came across a, uh, a German machine gun nest which opened fire on my, my unit. And uh, several of my uh, platoon personnel were killed a number were wounded before the uh, machine gun nest was wiped out. So had I not been wounded the day before, uh, I think there was a good likelihood that I would have bit the dust the next day. How was it dealing with knowing that you were so close to, to death? Um, I have always been, and I always was, a fatalist. Uh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I have no control over it. I put my faith in God. If it's His will that the worst is going to happen, that a bullet's going to have my name on it, uh, that's the way it's going to be. Because if you, if you uh, let fear envelop your actions, uh, you're not going to be an effective leader, and you've just got to try to display uh, an aura of uh, presence of mind and of confidence in doing what you're doing. Do you remember what it was like arriving first in Hurling? Um, when we first arrived there, it was... Uh, it was a pleasure because it gave us an opportunity to take baths, uh, which we had been unable to do uh, all the way across the Atlantic. Uh, you know, you don't. It wasn't easy to find a place to take a shower anywhere. So um, when we arrived at Harleen, it was the first opportunity we had to take a bath, and that was one of the pleasurable points uh, of that. Going across the, uh, the Atlantic itself on the Queen, <coughs> um, I was fortunate enough to be in a stateroom uh, on the Queen going across. Uh, now that might sound like a pretty uh, lush assignment, but the, uh, each stateroom had three layers of bunk beds, so there were probably uh, 12 to 15 uh, people in a stateroom. So it was pretty crowded and not quite as lush as that. All of the pools uh, on the Queen had been drained and th that was used as a uh, facility for serving mess, chow. And uh, we'd go down into the former swimming pool and get our food. Um, every inch of the ship was used. Um, the ship was so crowded that the uh, enlisted personnel would uh, sometimes sleep in shifts uh, outside on the decks uh, and then they'd come inside and uh, 
rest up. Um, we had no convoys because the Queen was capable of traveling at such a high rate of speed, relatively speaking, that no convoys were accompanying us. And uh, as uh, there was a fear of U-boats in the area, uh, the Queen was able to avoid U-boats by their uh, radar, sonar, etc. And uh, that was a little uneasy because you knew you were a sitting duck out there by yourself uh, with no convoy around to help protect you against uh, submarines. But so would be. You said you were a leader. Can you I describe was the your role? As the platoon leader of uh, a heavy weapons platoon, um, each platoon had four squads. Each squad was made up of uh, roughly eight to ten people. So there would be uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 people in a platoon. And I was the platoon leader. I had a platoon sergeant. And then there were corporals who were in charge of uh, each platoon. Um, after I got hit, my platoon sergeant took over. And uh, he did such a great job that he received a battlefield commission in my absence. When I came back to my unit, eventually on the Elbe River, he was already a second lieutenant. He had been promoted from a platoon leader to second lieutenant. It was a battlefield promotion. Wow. And did you take your old job back? Um, because he had taken over my platoon, I was assigned to a different company, and I ended up in uh, Company E, which was a rifle company. Um, I ended up with a rifle company as a platoon leader when I came back to my unit on the Elbe River. Um, were there many casualties in your unit? You described the day after the... We were, we were pretty fortunate because at the time and in the location that our unit was uh, moving forward through Germany, um, the Germans were pretty much in full-scale retreat after the fiasco that they experienced in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, they were on the run, and consequently, they retreated pretty readily in the uh, Battle of Central Europe. And that's why our unit went as far as the Elbe River, which was kind of the dividing line uh, across the river were the Germans, and the Russians were coming east into Berlin, and the Germans were kind of caught in the middle. But uh, we, had, we had casualties in our unit as a whole from artillery shells and like that but not a horrendous number. Were you ever a prisoner of war? No, I was fortunate in that respect. Would you like to explain crossing the Elbert River? Um, yes. Um, where, where we were back on the Elbe, uh, I was brought down to battalion headquarters um, a day or so after I arrived, and uh, the colonel in charge of our unit said, Blair, since you have been away vacationing for the last uh, three or four weeks, uh, our unit has been marching through Germany, and uh, I think that it would be appropriate for you to get together a volunteer patrol because we hope that somewhere along the line, we might be called upon to cross the Elbe River to try to link up with the Russians. Um, as a result of that assignment, I was able to pull together eight volunteers from the rifle companies, uh, not just my own company, but the other rifle companies as well. Uh, and that included one of the cooks who was uh, fluent in speaking Russian. 
Um, and on May 2nd of 1945, word came down from division headquarters that it was time for the Russian patrol to leave our side of the Elbe River and based on the best intelligence they had is that they had reason to believe that there was a tank task force of Russians moving toward the Elbe River uh, from the other side. So we got together the patrol, we got a hold of a fairly long boat with oars, and we started to cross the Elbe River. Uh, we came under some small arms fire, um, obviously pistols and rifle fire, because you could see the bubbles in the water from where the shots were landing. And we were able to get across the Elbe River without casualty. Uh, at that point, <coughs> um, I, I took the cook who could speak Russian, a radio man with me, and myself, and the three of us started to advance through a field toward the town of Balo. That's B-A-L-O-V. Balo is a small community which we could see from our side of the of the Elbe River. I left the rest of the patrol spread out on the banks of the Elbe in case we should run into trouble they would be able to provide us with uh, protective fire or they could be in a position to get back over to the American side if necessary. Uh, it was an extremely foggy morning and uh, as we were advancing through the field, the town of Belo was probably uh, 300 yards away. And through the fog, through the mist, we could hear the mechanical sounds of, of uh, mechanical equipment. And shortly thereafter, we could see upon overlooking a bank, the barrel of a gun traversing the area back and forth. Um, we didn't know but what that was a piece of German artillery uh, that was tracking our area or not. Um, we continued to advance and shortly I could see three people come down across the bank and start moving in our direction. I used my binoculars and I said to the radio man and to our, our cook, the interpreter, I said they are not wearing German uniforms. And as we came very close to them, I realized that they had to be Russian. And as we got within hailing distance of each other, I put my right arm, my right hand out, and I, I struck my breast like a me Tarzan approach and said, me American. And the fella grasped my hand and smiled and he said, God damn, am I glad to see you. One of the uh, most amazing things uh, that I ever had happen. He was a graduate of CCNY, City College of New York, of the Sorbonne in Paris. He was an intelligence officer assigned by the Russians to join the tank task force coming toward the Elbe from the Russian side to effect a link up with the Americans. Uh, we went back into the town of Belo as a result. And uh, we went into a, a restaurant 
and tables were set up and our entire patrol sat around this assembling of tables with a Russian between each American and there the leader of the tank task force proposed a toast to then President uh, Roosevelt and I in turn proposed a toast to Stalin. As we were expected to gulp down the vodka, I sipped my glass because as a non-drinker, I was fearful of the effects of the vodka. There was a smile from the Russians that I could see and I could sense. So I gulped down the vodka and they immediately filled the glasses again for another toast. That was my first experience in toasting and consuming a fair amount, to me, of vodka. Um, I had with me a 45 pistol with our division insignia on the grip, which I presented to the Russian uh, leader whom I met in the patrol. The Russian commander, in turn, gave me his 45 pistol, which by uh, an obviously look at the pistol had been used to a considerable degree over a considerable period of time. And that pistol I have uh, in my possession today. Um, we returned to the American side. Uh, when we initially made the link up, our radio man fired off a flare which was the signal to the American side that we had met the Russians. Um, a number of the Russians joined us on the return side, uh, going back to the American side, and they're members of our division from battalion to regimental headquarters to division headquarters all came down and were involved in embracing the Russians. And it proved to be a uh, celebratory situation. Um, I was not an immediate part of that celebration because uh, I was feeling at that time the results of the toasting to the Russians and felt it best to stay clear of the festivities uh, that was pretty much it. But it was uh, an awesome experience. Mm -hmm. What was the significance of the Americans and the Russians linking up in terms of, of the war? Of the war itself? Um, good question, because the initial link up of the Americans was at the Romagan uh, Bridge which was considerably to the south of where we were located, and that was within the, the Third Army. We were the Ninth Army. Our sector was in a uh, sequence or in a uh, latitude, if you will, opposite Berlin and north. And that was our, our sector of responsibility. So our patrol was the first link up of the Ninth uh, Army with the Russians. And what it effectively meant to us, all things being equal, was that this was the end of the war as far as we were concerned. And as a result, we did not lose any more personnel uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the Germans and that was one of the fears we had 
going across the Elbe River initially, coming under fire, was uh, this would be one heck of a time to have a casualty because we were so cl we could taste the end of the war if we could affect a link up, and effectively it worked out that way for us. So this squeezed out the Germans between the Americans and the Russians. Very much so. Um, the day after the, the link-up, and this was an agreement between the Russian command and the American command, is that we would advance no farther east than where we were on the Elbe River. In fact, we were in an area that was going to be assigned to the Russians. But understand this Russian task force that came in uh, came in as a uh, as a single arm coming from Berlin itself right up to the Elbe River. So there were a tremendous number of Germans who were anxious uh, to surrender. The morning after our link-up, our unit, which was between the old, old Elbe, which ran behind the farmhouse we were in, and the new Elbe, which we crossed to meet the uh, Russians. Um, the morning after the link-up, one of our, our people came downstairs, one of our, uh, one of our uh, soldiers, and said, Lieutenant, you gotta come up and see this. And when I came upstairs and I looked around, we were completely surrounded by Germans, all of whom had pistols, rifles, etc. Our personnel rolled a farm wagon out of the barn. The Germans all put their pistols, their binoculars, their rifles on the wagon. They wanted to leave all of their armament with the Americans and surrender to the Americans. Their goal, don't surrender to the Russians. Understand the Russians and Germans had been at war for an extended period of time. Germany had almost got into Moscow and, and the Russians started to fight back. The Russians experienced tremendous losses to the Germans much more so than the Americans did. Uh, so they, above all, did not want to be a prisoner of war to the Russians. They were delighted to be a prisoner of war to the, to the Americans. It got to the point that uh, <coughs> later that same day, there was a, um, a company of German SS uh, personnel who crossed the river onto our side and SS personnel were the most fearsome of the uh, of the German soldiers and uh, I went down to meet with the German group that wanted to surrender and uh, the officer in charge of the SS uh, platoon uh, indicated his willingness to surrender his personnel and I said through an interpreter I will accept your weapon and he looked at my insignia and shook his head no not to a lieutenant so I had to call regimental headquarters to have a senior officer come down and accept his surrender they were very status conscious. They wanted to surrender to the Americans, but not to a lieutenant. So one of our colonels accepted their resignation. And uh, we're going to take a break. Okay. The tape is almost run out, so we're going to switch tapes and then we'll continue. What took place in the weeks after you met with the Russians? Uh, about three weeks after the link-up patrol finished, um, we were notified that a, an award ceremony was going to be held uh, 
And at that ceremony, the Russian general was uh, able to present all of the members of the patrol with a form of recognition of their participation in the patrol itself. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive the Order of the Red Star, and the other members of the patrol received uh, medals or certificates acknowledging their participation in the program itself. Uh, within a relatively short time after that, and I mean in a matter of, of days, our unit was brought back to Hamelin, Germany, simply because where the award ceremony was held, which was close to the banks of the Elbe River, that area was all predestined to be occupied by the Russian troops. So we had to go back to an area that was agreed to be covered by the Americans. Um, the Americans, the French, the British, all had their own sector of responsibility after the war ended, where they were occupying uh, with us various parts of, of Germany. So our area was immediately in the um, Hamelin area, but we only stayed there for a relatively short period of time and then were brought back to the greater Heidelberg area. And there in a town called Hedesheim, our unit was stationed for a number of months. And that meant we were housed in civilian homes. Um, we were within close proximity, maybe 10 miles of Heidelberg. It gave us an opportunity to uh, experience some cultural activities in the Weinheim, the Heidelberg, the uh, Hedesheim area. And in fact, while we were there, President Hen Harry Truman had succeeded the deceased Franklin Roosevelt and was coming into our area to review our troops. And as a result, members of our unit were lined up on a highway uh, between Weinheim and Mannheim, Germany, and we were able to witness uh, President Truman going by in an open-air car, uh, and he saluted us as we saluted him. Uh, that was an interesting experience uh, as far as we were concerned. But immediately after the war, we were preparing for the eventual transfer to the Asian Theater of Operations, and I was de designated as the Japanese training officer. And that merely meant that I was given a manual of Japanese tactics and customs, and I was expected to conduct, conduct training sessions with our troops uh, based on the information that I gleaned out of the Japanese manual. Um, fortunately, however, I think I only had to conduct one or two sessions before the war in the Asian theater of our operation ended, and that meant the end of the war as far as we were concerned. Mm -hmm. So we just had to put in our time as members of the Army of Occupation in the area that we were assigned to, and based on the number of years of service uh, medals that we may have received, tours of duty. Um, we were ranked according to the length of time before we could be discharged from the, uh, from the Army. And uh, eventually my, uh, my number came up and we were able to 
returned to the United States and I uh, was able to be discharged at Fort Devens, uh, Massachusetts. Were you given any leave time after the war ended? Uh, since the, uh, before returning to the States, I was given leave time while we were in Hedersheim and uh, the French Tourism Association were sponsoring trips and I was able to take advantage of one of them which went down to the uh, French Riviera and uh, we were billeted in uh, a hotel in Cannes right on the Mediterranean uh, for a period of four or five days and then we were able to tour the wine country of France and uh, we stopped uh, in the village uh, of Lourdes where we could go to the Lourdes Shrine and that was at the uh, base of the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, the Pyrenees uh, separating France from Spain and uh, that gave us an opportunity to uh, get some enjoyable leave time. Day that your service ended? Um, this would have been in late March, early April of uh, 46. And uh, I, I simply remember getting my discharge papers and uh, returning by, by train to the Haven. My parents came down and, and met me. And it was kind of a joyous occasion for us, uh, particularly since I hadn't seen them uh, for a good number of years. Um, what did you do in the days and weeks after you returned home? Well, immediately upon returning, I, uh, I knew that I was going to have to uh, start looking for employment. Um, uh, I, uh, I went to the uh, bank where I formerly worked and uh, I met with uh, one of the mortgage officers there, a man by the name of Walter Angle who was a vice president and he was very active in the American Legion. Walter Angle did two things. He encouraged me to sign up as a member of the American Legion, which I did. And he also opened the door for me to gain employment with the Soldiers, Sailors, and Marine Fund, which was an agency of the state of Connecticut under the auspices of the American Legion. And the, the job ended up being a, uh, an interviewing type job where returning service personnel would be interviewed and if they had need for financial assistance and were eligible under the guidelines of the Soldier Sailors Marine Fund Act uh, for housing assistance, for food assistance, um, we could provide some modest funding to help the serviceman make the transition between military and civilian life. Um, it was uh, a type of job that I held for, oh, probably two months or so. And uh, I, was, I knew that the job was gonna have a termination period. Uh, so I went back to the bank to uh, see what kind of jobs might be available to me and I was told that because of other returning service personnel who had more length of service with the bank than I did that they really didn't have a spot for me. Uh, so through the Veterans Administration I was aware of the fact that the GI Bill offered funds to be available for returning personnel, which could be used for either uh, academic purposes 
or for on-the-job training purposes within an industry. Um, I, I was able to get an interview with the local office of the Trailmobile Company. That was a nationwide corporation that made truck trailers um, for the trucking industry. And they had their Connecticut operation in Connecticut, located out on Meriden Road here in Waterbury. And they had a job opening available for an assistant office manager. And that meant the GI Bill would subsidize a portion of my salary at the Trailmobile Company, and the Trailmobile Company would pay the, the difference between what the VA would, would uh, subsidize. And I worked there for uh, probably six months or so on a subsidized arrangement uh, by, the, uh, by the VA. And eventually, a job opened for a full-time office manager's job, and I was given that opportunity to be the office manager of the local branch. After several years, the local branch operation was terminated, and I was given the opportunity to take a similar job with the Trailmobile Company in Syracuse, New York, which I accepted on a provisional basis, provisional meaning if they like me and if I like them. Uh, and I worked up there for several months and uh, realized that that was not the type of job that I wanted to continue to pursue as a career. So I resigned my position up there, came back to Waterbury, I was unemployed. We had three children living in an apartment, and I went back to the bank and uh, asked if they had any opportunity for my returning. And they said, well, at the present time, we are looking for someone to serve in the capacity as a summer replacement teller while our personnel go on vacation. So I was able to obtain my foot in the door by taking a job as a temporary employee. Uh, I worked that job for a number of months, and during that time, knowing that the job was not permanent, I uh, applied with the state of Connecticut for a job as a wage hour investigator for their labor department. And uh, toward the end of the summer, I received a uh, notification from the state of Connecticut that they'd like to have me come up to Hartford for an interview. So I brought that information to the gentleman at the bank who was in charge of hiring, showed him what I was requested to do, and he said, if you will forget about the state of Connecticut job, we will offer you a permanent job at the bank. So I accepted that on the spot and uh, returned to the bank, notified the state that I would not be pursuing that job and thanked them for their, their interest. And consequently, I, uh, I stayed with the bank, working in a variety of positions, from teller uh, to loan clerk to uh, operating the general ledger, which is the books of the bank. I had been through all of the uh, uh, positions in the bookkeeping department. And after uh, several years, I was uh, promoted to uh, being an officer of the bank. Um, I ended up serving a total of 41 years at the bank and uh, retired in 1986. Um, how 
did your service and experiences affect your life after? Um, they were beneficial to the degree that I had had experience in managing and leading personnel. And that's something that can carry over to any industry by anyone where it gives them a, uh, a good handle on viewing what motivates people, how to motivate people, leadership qualities, things of that type. military experience influence your thinking about war in general? Um, repeat that. Did, did your military experience influence your thinking now about war? Only to the extent that I know the, the horror of war. Um, I, I saw so much of the killing side during my short experience in action that made me appreciate life and made me appreciate the job that our service personnel today are faced with doing uh, overseas. I think that the bulk of the information uh, has been adequately covered. Um, I've, I've, I stay active in, in uh, several veterans organizations, active to the degree that I support them financially, uh, the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Disabled American Veterans. Um, I don't participate in their membership meetings, but I, I do support them financially when they have fundraising drives, etc. And I know the great job that they do. Great. Is there anything else? I think that covers it pretty well. Thank you for your time today. You're welcome.